about um, some of the most popular websites there are. And let's think about what we've learned and try to think about the functionality that they have and let's see if we can sort of sort things out and make some sense of it. Let's think first of all about Google. We can go to Google As you know, I'm sure. <laughs> we can go to Google, as you know, Address and type and virtually anything L in e and get C -O -M results about web pages that have that. Window closed. So let's say, no, I'm not, you know, I'm hungry, thinking about what's for dinner. I type in I Italian restaurants. A and space R E S T A U I think the R A N T still on. Connecting. Tool tip. Show hidden icons. Tool tip. So L C C C dot L C three in speakers. One hundred percent. There we go. Oh here it is. All right, type Italian restaurant in. And here we go with some results. And interesting thing, if you notice, is the top results is a restaurant in Sheffield. All right, Sheffield Lake. Sheffield, Sheffield Lake. Second pop most popular result is one in North Ridgeville. In Elyria, in Elyria, Elyria, Sheffield, and so on down the line. Wow, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That the best Italian restaurants in the world are located within just a short distance of here. All right, let's look something else up. Let's look Asian restaurants. Wow, also Elyria, Elyria, Cleveland, and so on down the line. Well, clearly something's funny here, right? The results that we're getting are based on a couple of factors, all right, at least. Um, there really is a, a, a bunch of factors that come into play for determining what results Google returns. But the two most obvious ones that we are noticing is number one, it depends on what we type in up here. All right, we search for Italian restaurants, we get results about Italian restaurants. If we type in Asian restaurants, we get results about Asian restaurants. All right. The second thing is, is it's obvious that the location that we are in has something to do with the results. So I type in Italian restaurants, guess what? It shows me Italian restaurants that are in the area. All right, the thought being that if I'm looking for an Italian restaurant, I'm not gonna drive to San Francisco or fly to Rome or anything like that. That I want one that is relatively nearby, all right? So the thought is here that there has to be some sort of brains behind the HTML, all right? If you were to look at your web pages that you made the first week in this class and pull them up on your screen, they would look exactly the way that they looked the day that you turned them in, all right? Not unless you went back and changed them, but they would look like exactly like the day that you turned them in. You could send them to your friend in Canada. They would look the same, all right? It really wouldn't matter. They would look identical and they're not going to change. That is because HTML is, uh, when you use only HTML, you create what is called static pages. The word static means not changing, 
If you say something is static, it means that it's not changing at all. All right. Google, however, is using something called dynamic pages. All right. In other words, it changes. And it changes based on two things. If we were to have my brother, let's say, who lives in New York City, Google Italian restaurants, he's going to get a whole different set of results. He's going to get results close to where he lives. All right. So it's dynamic. It changes based on the location of the person that's doing the Googling. All right. In addition, it's going to change based on what I typed in here. If I were to type in pizza place, let's say, instead of Italian restaurant, I'm going to get slightly different results. All right. And if I were to type in Indian restaurant instead of Asian restaurant, I'm going to get different results for there too. So nothing that we've learned allows for this to happen. All right. Nothing that we've learned allows for these dynamic pages. The web pages that we've created so far are static. HTML creates static pages. So something else has to be going on here for this to work the way that it does. And if you think about it for a second, logically, it doesn't even make sense that Google would have an HTML page for every possible thing that you could search for. Because how many things could you search for? Let's see, a lot of them. All right, And therefore, it isn't practical or possible even for Google to have a results HTML page set up ready for any possible search. And you know what? Even if it did, how would it know which one to give you? So obviously, something else that comes into play. And then something else is called server-side scripting. Now, server-side scripting is where you have a program that creates web pages on the fly. The program writes the HTML. So your job as a web developer is to write the program that writes the HTML. Well, in order to do that, obviously, you need to know how to write HTML yourself, right? So that's why we learned HTML throughout the first part of the semester. Sometimes when I say that, like, well, you know, you write PHP code or something, everyone's like, well, why did we learn HTML then? Well, you learn HTML because that's what your PHP code is going to write, you know. If you're going to write a program to do a payroll calculation, you need to know how that payroll calculation works yourself before you can write the code to write and do the payroll calculations, right? So if you're going to write code to write HTML, you need to know how to write HTML yourself so that you can write the code to do that. All right. So the way it works is this. With static pages, this is a situation. We have the client connected to the internet. that makes requests for the web server. The client makes requests. The server responds to requests. Even if you ask for a web page that doesn't exist, the server is going to respond with an error message saying, hey, this page doesn't exist. Or if you try to access a secure area of the website, the server is going to respond to that by saying, hey, you're not allowed to access these pages. So that's what we have. And the client is, is a person on a computer running a web browser, or it could be a device, a person using a mobile device. It could be um, a, a bot, a program that goes through and indexes the web for like Google or other search engines. The client is simply making requests. It's asking for a web page. It makes it through the internet. and We don't care how it makes it through the internet. That's why we draw that as a cloud. But it gets routed through a whole bunch of servers. 
It finally ends up at the, at the precise web server that you've asked for. Again, we talked about this earlier, the whole thing of IP addresses and domain names and DNS servers. That's a mechanism by which the internet knows how to get your request from your computer to the web server that you really want. And then the flip side is true too. That happens when the server sends a response back to you, the client. Okay. Now, in the case of static web pages, the finished web pages are simply sitting here as HTML, CSS, image files, and so on. And when you ask for them, the server simply grabs them and sends them to you. It's like if you go into McDonald's and order a Big Mac, right? Go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, what does the server do? The server turns around, reaches in the bin of Big Mac, and gives it to you. Likewise, grabs the fries, gives it to you. So in this case, the server's job is simply to deliver stuff that's already been prepared. All right? These are the kinds of pages that we've done in this class. Static HTML pages. Now we have not put them on a web server, but if we did, all the server would have to do is find those pages and deliver them to the client. All right. Server-side scripting pages, there's an additional step in the process. Instead of finding a completed HTML page, The server grabs a script. And what is a script? The script is a little program. All right. How many of you have ever written a program either in C Sharp or VB or all right, many of you have. All right. It's like that. In fact, you know, it's the same languages are used. Um, C Sharp is used, VB could be used. Um, PHP is a, another popular one, and there, there's a whole set of them. And it doesn't matter what language your script is in, the process works the same. So if I'm talking about PHP or ASP.NET, this model holds for all these. All right? So the script is accessed by the server. The server has a little bit extra work now. The server, instead of simply delivering the page, the server executes the script and outputs HTML and that gets sent back to the client. So there's an extra step in there. Continuing with the food analogies, I, almost all my analogies deal with food one way or another. I don't know what that tells you, but it's like the difference between going to McDonald's and going to Subway, right? If you go to McDonald's, you order a Big Mac, what does the server do? There's a bin of Big Macs behind the server. The server simply grabs a Big Mac and gives it to you, all right? In that case, everything is pre-prepared. The server's job is simply to deliver it to you. Dynamic pages are more like Subway. You go in the subway, do they have bins with all the possible combinations of sandwiches? No, of course not. Why not? Well, that would be impractical, right? Because when you go to subway, you can give your choice of bread, you know, wheat bread, Italian bread, whatever the other choices are, all right? You can get different meat on it, you can get it toasted or not toasted, you can get it with different kinds of cheese, you can get it with different kinds of toppings, vegetables, sauces, and so on. So even something like a turkey club sandwich, there's not a single turkey club sandwich, right? Um, there's, uh, there would literally be hundreds if not thousands of combinations 
of turkey club sandwiches, right? If you look at all the different variables that would go into a turkey club sandwich. Someone might want spinach on there. Someone might want onions. Someone might want onions and olives. Someone might just want olives and so on. So if you're going to do all the permutations, there'd be thousands of turkey club sandwiches combinations. Well, they're not going to have one of each, all right, back there where the server has to go and grab and deliver it. Just like Google's not going to have a search page for every possible thing you could search for. Too many combinations, right? So instead what they have is they have a recipe. This is how you make a turkey club. A turkey club has, well, whatever's on a turkey club. I don't know, turkey and bacon maybe? I don't know. And then the server asks the customer for some details about it. Do you want, what kind of bread do you want? Um, do you want it toasted or not toasted? Do you want cheese on it or not? What kind of cheese do you want? What kind of toppings do you want? So there's a script or a recipe, all right, for how to make a sandwich. And that recipe gets executed by the server in Subway. All right, the server does that step. And they get some information from you, the customer, the client. All right. So let's talk about web pages now. All right. Let's talk about a Google search. There is a script on Google which goes and accesses Google's database and uses their magical algorithm to get the best possible search results. That's what made the Google folks rich, right? That they did a better job of indexing the internet than anyone else up to that point. All right? So that's their bread and butter, right? And then they figured out a way to make some money off of it. All right? However, in order for the script to do its job, it needs some input from you. All right. Now, where does it get the input from you? Well, it actually gets the input from you in a couple different ways. One way is obvious. The other ways are not quite as obvious. It gets input from you via what you type in here. All right. So you supply the input to the server-side script through what is called a form, an HTML form. And this is one of the elements that you can have in a form. You can have a text box on a form. So that's one way that you can give information to um, the server in order to prepare your sandwich. All right? is that you tell them, all right? On a web page, you tell the web server by entering in a form. In fact, some places like have little cards that you can fill out, you know, when you order stuff. And you just hand that to the server. And this would be like that. You know, you check, yes, I want lettuce and Swiss cheese and, and mayonnaise on it or whatever. Well, this is a way that you can give that information to the web server is through the form. Now, what's the other way that you get information to the server? All right. Well, it comes as part of your request. In other words, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. All right. That's a whole set of rules for how you request a web page and how a web page is responded to, or how a request is responded to. Part of the request includes your IP address, all right? Your IP address, if you remember, is the unique address of your machine on the internet. And the IP address can be used with limited accuracy to tell the web server where you're located, all right? It's not a GPS. It's not going to tell me that we're sitting in the UP building at Loring County Community College. But the IP address can usually be looked up in a table of IP addresses to see what internet service provider that IP address was given to 
and they can get an approximate location on where you are. All right? So, it might not know that we're at Lorain County Community Colleges, but it knows that we're in the Elyria area. And if you're looking up restaurants, that's like good enough, right? Good enough to, uh, to tell you. Let's go to Google Maps. Just for laughs. Again, notice what it did. It, it knows we're kind of around this area, right? Doesn't have us pinpointed as being on, let's see, where would we be? About here, all right? But it knows we're kind of in this area, all right? How does it know that? Again, it looks at the IP address. It knows that that IP address was assigned to an internet service provider in this area, so it knows approximately where we're located. All right. Now, we're not going to write server-side scripting in this class. That is covered in other classes. That's covered in CISS 232, and that's covered in CISS 243. All right. But we're going to do part of the equation. And the part of the equation that we're going to do is we're going to learn how to write the HTML forms. All right. The HTML form is the way that the web, uh, the client can give to the web server addition, uh, additional information about their search so that the server can do the search correctly. Let's, how do we get to advanced search here? advanced search here. We could actually go and, and, and give more information. All right. Um, all these words, exact words and phrases, any of these words, blah, 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 blah. So let's say we are planning a, a trip to Toronto and we want information about Toronto. Um, we could say, I want Italian restaurants, but I want the search, I only want to see things that contain the word Toronto in it. None of these words, any region, so I could say Canada, for example, last time updated, and so on and so forth. Now, there are three different form controls on this page. Form controls are what you can use to put information in. All told, there are more than that, but there's three on this page, and let's, let's take a look at them to summarize. There's a text box, all right? Text box is where you can type in a single line of text, all right? This is a drop-down. What's the difference between a drop-down and a text box? Right. A, a, a drop-down is limited to certain choices. So you can't put anything in. All right? You have to choose one of the choices. And why do you suppose that is? Why, why use a drop-down instead of... Why couldn't you use a drop-down for the term you're searching for? Yeah, you, you couldn't possibly have a drop-down of every single thing that someone might search for. That doesn't make sense. Why could you have a drop-down for language? Yeah, there are, there are a certain number of languages that exist, you know, probably like a couple hundred of them maybe, I don't know, at least that are in current usage, 
All right. And why use a drop down for that? The more specific you are, and the more consistent you are. All right. So, for example, if you notice, there is Chinese simplified, Chinese traditional. Sometimes people, you know, sometimes the Chinese language is called Mandarin because that's a, a, a version of the Chinese language. Well, Mandarin isn't a choice. Well, if this was a text box where you could type anything in, you could type something in that wasn't done exactly, that, 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 that the website isn't expecting. All right? Likewise with region. If I were to search for something in the United States, United States is the term that they want us to use. All right. Someone might be might type in USA or U period S period A period or America or something like that. Right. Whereas if the server is expecting the input to come in in a certain format, then it's best to limit the user's options to just those values that the, that the user is expecting. Okay? So therefore, a drop-down can effectively do that. What are some other form controls that exist besides a text box and a drop-down? What are some other things that you've seen on a form? Check boxes. All right? How do check boxes work? Okay. Yeah, you actually mentioned two of uh, the different kinds of controls, check boxes and radio buttons. So we have text boxes, which are a single line of text. We have drop-downs, where you have a list of predefined options that the user can choose. We have radio buttons, where the user can choose between a list of predefined choices, but they could only choose one. Then we have checkboxes. where we could say, pick all the sports that you like to play. Tennis, golf, basketball. So the difference between a radio button and checkboxes would be that for checkboxes, I could check all three of them. If I were to do this with radio buttons, I could pick my favorite sport, for example. All right. Drop-downs typically work where you can only make one selection, although you can actually configure drop-downs to allow more than one selection as well. But that's usually not done because that confuses people. All right. When would you use radio buttons versus a drop-down? When there's too many. Which would you use when there's too many? Use a drop-down if there was a lot of them. All right. Uh, if there was a few of them, you might use um, radio buttons instead. So if I was going to have a list of all the possible languages in the world where there's a couple hundred of them, a drop-down would be a better approach. Whereas if my website only supported three languages, let's say, English, French, and Spanish, I might do that. The advantage of this is, is everything's laid out in front of the user. The user can see all the choices and make the selection as opposed to hunting through a drop-down. But again, if you have 200 choices, then going through a drop-down is probably better. What are some other form controls? Yes? There are some options from, to. From and to? Yeah, that actually... Uh, 
Oh, do you mean like this, where you make a selection there and choose it, or where you have a text box? Like a range of things. Okay. So, uh, yeah. In fact, we had it on that page, where, where um, we could put in, I think, a, a, a number range or something like that. I'm going to put this one over here. Because we're going to cover basic form controls. And then we're going to talk about some of the ones that are in HTML5. The range control, if I'm not mistaken, is part of HTML5. You would have had to do it with just two text boxes in, in previous versions of HTML4, but I think in HTML5 there's a range. Other form controls. Yes? That's actually, the one that I was talking about actually is a sort of mutant drop-down. Alright, where you set certain parameters of the drop-down to make it look and behave that way. And the same thing, you'd, you'd do two of those. All right, the other ones include a text area, which is for multiple lines of text. So like if you have comments, um, you would want to give the person plenty of room to type in and not just a single line. So that would be a text area. On, my, on the original example I had, I said I had, we had three, but I only mentioned two, right? There was a text box, there was a drop down. Other thing is a submit button. There's actually two other kinds of buttons, but we won't talk about those for now. We'll leave those and we'll, we'll talk about those later. A submit button tells the form, all right, go and send your information to the server to get processed. Yes? Yes. That would be an HTML5 control, a date picker. Like everything else, like with sections and articles and all that, in HTML5 there were some new form elements introduced that took stuff that used to be done a certain way and like made a more specialized, better version of it. So a date picker would be an example of that. So we'll leave that under HTML5. Other quest other, uh, any questions at this point? So... Let's talk about the form cycle. All right, when we go to Google. Let me draw this up again. When I first visit Google or any search engine, let's say, I'm given a blank form. that probably has a text box and a submit button on it. So if I typed in, in fact in our example, we're going to use Bing, simply because Bing is a little easier to sort of reverse engineer and, and play with. But when we go to Bing, what we get is we get a blank form that contains a text box and a submit button. That's the first step. You request, you get the form. I fill in the form with what I am searching for. And click submit. That request goes to the server that I want to do a search. And what also goes to the server is the fact that I'm searching for HTML as opposed to PHP or ASP.NET or anything else that I possibly could be searching for. In addition, stuff like where I'm located goes to the server as part of the HTTP request. Now, in the case of HTML, that's not really relevant, 
right? There's not an Illyria version of HTML and a New York version of HTML. So for something like that, where I'm located is not going to count as much as it did when I was searching for restaurants. All right? At any rate, my request is going to go to the server and it's going to contain this form information. The server is going to be notified that this person wants to do a search and what's more, they're specifically searching for HTML. All right? The server then does its magic, prepares HTML, and sends the response back to the client. It's important to recognize that it doesn't matter what the server is doing over here. The client gets back the same sort of stuff, a web page. Gets back HTML code, gets back CSS code, gets back JavaScript code maybe, gets back images. Just like if you go to McDonald's or you go to Subway, you're going to come out with a sandwich. All right, doesn't matter. The sandwich is going to be different. The sandwich is going to be customized more if you go to Subway as opposed to McDonald's. But in both cases, you get delivered what you want to consume. That is a sandwich. Well, what do clients consume? Clients consume web pages. So when they make a request, that's what they get back. All right, let's look at the Bing search engine and let's create our own form to submit to the Bing search engine. Now this is something that they allow you to do because they want you to use their search engine so we'll take advantage of that. So I go to Bing and I type in HTML and I click submit. I get a list of results. And again, these results I really doubt would matter much no matter where I typed it in. With the exception of maybe um, if I typed it in um, a different country, maybe it would give me results for that language. You know, if I typed this in in France, maybe it would give me French pages. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a web page that essentially duplicates this functionality. And we're not using, we're not learning server-side scripting in this class, so instead we're going to use their server-side script, which again is, they allow you to do, so it's not really an issue. So I'm going to go and open up notepad and I'm going to put the basic tags in All right, first tag we're going to create is the form tag. And if you're writing this down in notes, leave some blank spaces here. All right, so I'll leave some blank spaces in there because we're going to come in and fill those in later because there's, there's some missing information there that we need to supply. And then there's going to be an end form tag. So, what goes in the form tag are all the form controls that you want to send to the server. Think of the form tag as being like the envelope. Alright? 
You may send a whole bunch of things to the server. When we looked at that Google advanced search, there was a dozen or so different fields that we could send to the server. All right. So the form tag went around all of them. If we were to look at that Google advanced search, there'd be one form because we're sending a packet of all of those dozens of pieces of information. All right. It's not as though every piece has its own form tag. Just like if you were sending a letter that had um, four or five pages to it, you wouldn't put each page in its own envelope. You'd put the whole letter, all four or five pages in one envelope. Now, I'm going to use an unordered list to contain my form elements. Why am I going to do that? Well, because really that's what a form is. A form is a list of things that you're going to send to the server. All right. Now, we're not going to like the way this looks. I can almost guarantee that. But that doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because we can change the way it looks by using CSS. Okay? So, My first form field is going to be an input tag. Oops. Name equals Q. I did not randomly pick that name. All right. I'll tell you in a bit how I pick that name or how I how I'm why I'm using that name type equals text I forgot to put quotes around that let me go back and do that let me make this just a bit smaller I can do that. What does the slash greater than sign means? It means that that is a starting and ending tag all rolled into one. All right, and that's my first list item. The thing that I want to search for. The next thing we need is we need a button to send it to the server. And that's not going to be an input type equals text, because it's not a text box. It is going to be a submit button. And I'm going to put a value on it. All right. So let's save this and let's look at it. And spoiler alert, this isn't going to work. <coughs> All right. Here we go. Here's our page. I double click it to open it. And there we go. We have our text box and we have our submit button. And I can type something in here. I 
was not anticipating that. Not sure why IE was having a problem with this, but at any rate, I can type in I want to search for HTML, and I can click search, and really nothing happens. Why do you think nothing happened? It's not going anywhere. Let me give a letter analogy. All right. If I type in the search box what I want to search for, that means that I put in the envelope my letter. I click search. That means that I mailed the letter. What I have not put is the address to who is getting that letter. All right. Who do I want to get the letter? I want to get, I want the Bing search engine to get the letter. I nowhere have I said that if you look at the code. I haven't said anything about where to send that letter. Where you send the letter, or where you send the form data, is part of the form tag, and it is the action property. Now, in the case of Bing, That is the address I want to send it to. And you can't see that, right? That is the address I want to send it to. Everything before the question mark. The method we'll ignore for now, but I'm putting in method of get. Think of this as being two ways that you can send a letter. There's get and there's post. So now when I do this, now I've specified who's going to get this data. So, I go in here, I type in, I click search, and bang, I get the search results from Bing. Now, let's come back to the question of why I pick the name Q for that. And this URL contains information about why I picked Q. Everything before the question mark represents the address of the script that's going to handle this form data. It's going to do the search. Everything before the question mark is going to do that. So that's why I put that in for the action. That's the address of the script that gets this form, that processes this form. So that's why I put that in here. The reason I pick Q is if I look after the question mark is what is called the query string. And when you use the get method, 
the data is passed on the query string. So it's passed as part of the URL. The other way, post sends the data in a different way and it's not part of the URL. Now, when the data is sent on the query string, there's the name of the field, an equal sign, and the value of the field. So this is a search from Bing. This is telling me, effectively, that I search for HTML, therefore Bing is expecting that to be called, have the name of Q on the query string. So therefore, I put Q as the name of my text box. So that then will match the query string and look, notice when I search, this is my query string. And notice that up till here, is the same. So I've matched their query at least up to that point. <coughs> the Bing script is smart enough to disregard the slight differences that I have, the stuff after this. The ampersand then gives the next pair of data. Ampersand next pair of data. And all this stuff is sort of advanced search things that we don't really need to do a simple search. So what happens if we call this something else? We don't call it Q if we call it X. Doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because Bing is expecting this variable to be called Q on the query string, and we called it X. Therefore, it says, hey, this person hasn't said what they're looking for. They haven't supplied the value of Q, so I'm just going to give them back to the regular query page so that they can enter in their query properly. Questions about this? Let's review the form. We have a form tag that goes around everything that's part of the form. The action is the address of the script that's going to process that form. In this case, it is www.bing.com slash search. Normally, you write both pieces of it. So if you're taking a PHP class, you will write both the HTML form and you'll write the PHP to process it. But because we don't study server-side scripting in this class, we let someone else do the server-side script for you. Method relates to how the data gets passed. And in this case, the method is the query string. So we're, method of get represents the query string, which means that we're sending the data as part of the URL, the query string. And that's good for starters because that doesn't allow, or that allows us to see the data that we're passing. All right. So if it didn't work, I could look at the query string and figure out if the data I'm passing doesn't match the data that the script is expecting. Now in some cases, you might want to use post and then the data won't be shown on the query string. That would be like if you were sending a password or something. You wouldn't want to send password as part of the query string. The form then consists of a UL that contains two LIs, because really that's what a form is. It's a list of 
items that we're sending to the server. The first one's a text box, which is accomplished via the input tag, type equals text. And the second one being a submit button. Has a name, type of submit, and a value of search. The value of search is what the label on the button says. Now we should be back in business because I corrected that error and we can go and do the search. Questions about this? Now you have an assignment where, let's take a look at your assignment, all right, that you have to do. And we haven't covered enough to do the assignment quite yet. All right? But let's take a look at it anyhow. These are the, this table, by the way, is not how it should look, all right? This table is giving you the values that it should have. And in this case, you should have a field for the name, and the name of that field should be FRM name. I'm giving you that information. Just like I gave you the information in this example, the search term has to have a name of Q. Phone, FRM phone. Now, where you see FRM size, S for small, M for medium, L for large, what's that effectively telling you? What's that tipping you off to? Yes. Yeah. There's going to be three possible values. So what form control are we not going to use? We're not going to use a text box. Why not? Because a text box you can type anything in. So what are we going to use instead? Maybe radio buttons? Maybe a drop down. Alright. Now we haven't covered those yet. We'll cover those um, probably um, you know, probably not today, probably on Thursday. But you can read ahead if you want to. What about toppings and delivery? What are we going to use for those? Check boxes. Why wouldn't we use a radio button? Because you could have yes to all of these. Now you could have, now, now let me back up for a second, you actually could use a radio button. You could have pepperoni, yes or no. Cheese, yes or no. Delivery, yes or no. So you could use a radio button. You could use a drop down. Pepperoni, yes or no. Or you could use a checkbox for that. It's your job as a form designer to, to figure out what makes sense for the particular form. All right. Extra instructions, what is that going to be? Well, maybe a text box, maybe something else. Text area, because the extra instructions could be more than one line. Now, here is a script that you need to submit your form data to. I've given you the script. A 
Okay. I will have to make sure that that's up and running. Because apparently there's an issue with that. Now, I want you to do two different CSSs for, it, for this page. Make it look different. Use this as a chance to practice your CSS skills and make the two pages look as different as possible. I also want you to validate your pages and your CSS by going to w, uh, w3c.org and running your HTML and CSS through the validator. Test this on multiple browsers. Now, let's get back to styling this. And let's talk about styling and accessibility for this form. Now, this form is simple. We only have one field. But as you can imagine, you could have multiple fields in a form. And for someone that can see, that's not a problem, right? It's easy to know that this text belongs to this text box. Why? Because it's next to it. However, with a screen reader, as you tab around the form, it's not going to be that obvious because a user can't see the label next to a text box. And as they tab around, the text box simply puts them in a text field. That's why we use, for accessibility purposes, we use a label tag. And Label 4Q four, four points to the thing that has an ID of Q. This gets to be confusing because form elements have names and IDs. And they're used um, for different things. The ID is used to associate the label with it. The name is used for what the server calls a particular field. It's okay to give them the same value. Much of the time, many of the times, it will be the same value. There are exceptions, like with radio buttons. With radio buttons, the ID and the name will not be the same value. So let's style this a little bit. And for this case, I'm going to put the CSS code right in the HTML. Just for simplicity purposes.
All right. There, that looks more like a completed form. So again, the idea that, gee, I don't like the way that that looks like as an ordered, an unordered list, is irrelevant because we can style it to make it look however we, we want to. Accessibility, the label tag ties this guy to that guy. All right, we do have a class evaluation today, so I'm going to spend about 10 more minutes going over different examples of different form controls. Even though this doesn't fit into the Bing, search will throw some things in just for, actually I'll make a second copy of this and we'll, we'll start a new form from scratch. So this form isn't going to submit to anything, so I'm going to get rid of the action, and I'm just going to replace it with a pound sign. That means the form will call itself back. Let's fill out a form for someone that is interested in information about Lorain County Community College. So, we'll put a name field in here. Let's put in for status. We're going to use a drop down for status. A dropdown is not done with an input tag. A dropdown is, is done with two different tags, a select tag and an option tag. The option tag, I'm sorry, the select tag sort of goes around the whole list of options. The options are the individual choices. So maybe if this was an informational form for LC, select ID equals status, name equals status. Again, two different things. In the case of a dropdown, they can be the same. I can do something like this. And I'm just going to consider three options here. There, I'm sure there's a lot more other 
options. Um, it would. <laughs> It would if we were actually submitting this to a, a, form, a, a script, but yeah, let's, let's make sure we, we get everything right. So let's put three statuses. High school student, high school graduate, and a college student. All right, I'm sure we could think of more categories, but that'll work. These are all wrapped up in a select statement. The select statement has a name, and that's what the server's going to be expecting, and it has a status which matches a label. Each option has two pieces. It has the piece between the start and end option tag, and it has a value. The user is going to see this. So this is a descriptive, descriptive way of putting the status. What is the value? The value is what the script is going to see. So I may have an application that is looking for high school students to be coded with a value of HS. Well, HS, if I just showed that to the user, they would not necessarily have any idea what HS meant, or HG, or CS. They might be able to figure it out, but my program, I want to make sure that they make the right selection, so I give them a descriptive name for it, as well as the code that the program is going to use. Now notice I don't make this a text box because I don't want someone just to type any old thing in. High school student, attending high school, goes to high school, all those sorts of things that you could type in if it was a text box. I want to limit the selections to some predefined selections. If we look at this then, We have a drop down that has those choices. Now again, the user sees the values between the option tag. But behind the scenes, if I submitted this, what gets sent to the server is the value of the option. Any of you have had the database class, CISS 143? Okay, just a couple of you. All right. You see this a lot. For example, employee ID, you know. Let's say you want to do a search for a professor here at LC. See what classes I teach in the fall. Either so you know which ones to take or know which ones to avoid. All right? In the database, information about me is stored under my professor number, right? What is my professor number? You probably don't know what that is. It would be very unlikely for you to know what that is. But you do know my name. Now the database to do the search to show the classes I teach is probably based off of my professor number. But you probably don't know that. But you do know my name. So if there was a drop down for professors, it would show you the name of the professor, so it would show you the professors listed by name, and then you could select that and the database that does the search would get sent the value it needs, that is the professor's ID. All right, we'll leave it off here. Next time we'll polish off forms and maybe start tables. We'll see how that goes. Um, Time for the evaluation. I need a volunteer to take this to the business building office, which is BU 211.